Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. Part 1 I'm thinking of taking a year off university next year, and I'd like to travel around Europe. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Good morning. How can I help you? I'm thinking of taking a year off university next year and I'd like to travel around Europe. OK, then. Do you have any idea where you'd like to go? Well, I was thinking of starting in France and then working my way up to Eastern Europe, possibly going as far as Slovakia. Well, there are a number of ways you can do this, and we have various options available. It really depends on your budget and how you'd like to travel. That's just the thing, really. Um, I mean, I've just finished my second year at university, so obviously I'd like to do it in as cheap a way as possible. That's fine. Could you give me a rough idea of the price range you're looking at? Realistically speaking, I'm hoping to pay between about £700 and £900. Pounds. I could stretch to £1,100, pounds, but that's really my limit. How long are you thinking of going for? About 10 months. To be honest, you'd be better off travelling for about 7 months, if that's your budget. OK, that's not too bad. So, how would you suggest I travel? Well, because of the time limit, I don't think walking is a viable option. Of course, in this day and age, the most convenient way to get around is by flying, particularly if you've got quite a bit you want to see in a short space of time. Saying that, I still think the best way to get around Europe is by train. As a student, you can also get a student rail card, which means cheap affairs. That sounds brilliant. How do I go about getting a rail card? Well, if you decide that's what you want to do, then we can organise that all for you. You'll need to fill in a form and provide us with two passport photos, mm -hmm. and we'll do the rest. It costs about £36 plus about £10 administration costs. Great. That's really not expensive at all. And what about buses? I was just thinking if I decide to go to places which are a bit more remote... There are always local buses, but these are not always a good idea. They can be quite unreliable and in some areas quite dangerous because the buses tend to be overcrowded and some of the drivers drive way too fast. So I would suggest you don't do this. That sounds quite frightening. So what are my options then? You could hire a car, but it can be expensive. Still. I do think if you're thinking about going to smaller towns and places which are off the beaten track, then hiring a car is by far the better way to do it. You can also look at sharing the costs by hiring a car with someone else. That's a good idea. I guess I could put a message on the internet. You could do that. But don't forget that you meet people when you're travelling, and you'll probably find someone who's going to the same place as you are. That's true. I want to stay in youth hostels, so I'm sure I'll find people who are interested in going to the same places. Oh, one last thing. What about taxis? I was thinking about if I go out at night. I use taxis all the time here. Oh, but taxis abroad are a different story. In certain countries, they're no problem, but by and large, taxi fares are high. Oh. If you do go out at night, try walking home, but make sure you don't do this alone. Try and find people to go out with at night or come home at a reasonable time. But if you're staying in youth hostels, you should find plenty of young people to go out with at night. I'm sure I will. Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10.
Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Now, have you thought about how you'd like to travel to France? Not really, no. There are basically three ways. You can go by ferry, which leaves every day and night, or there's the hovercraft, which is more pricey, but will get you there quicker, and, of course, you could fly. Well, I don't think flying is an option for me, as it'll be too expensive. So I suppose I'll choose one of the other two. It's a pity, really, as I don't fancy the idea of travelling by sea. Last time I did that, I got terribly seasick. <laughs> well, you're in luck then, as at the moment there's a special deal on flights to France. Ah. In fact, a plane ticket is now half the price of a ferry ticket, which is usually the cheapest option. That's great. I'll do that then. I much prefer flying anyway. I'll need to get some details off you then. Firstly, how will you be paying? Cash, cheque or credit card? If you pay by cheque, you'll need a cheque guarantee card. I don't have my cheque book with me, so it'll have to be by credit card. Fine, that's no problem. If you could just sign over here, and then we'll have a look at flight times, and I can sort out a youth travel card for you. Fine. Oh, can I use your pen, please? No problem. Now, let's look at times. There is a flight leaving at 9am, and one that leaves half an hour later... Or you can choose a later flight at 11.30. No, I think 11.30 is too late, so I think I'd prefer the flight that leaves after 9. I'm not very good at getting up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Just give me a moment. Right, that's booked for you. Please remember that if you want to change this, you must give 24 hours notice or you will lose your place. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2 You will hear part of a local radio program about fighting air pollution in Canadian towns. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, folks, and welcome to the Information Roundup on your own local radio station. This is Larry Knowles talking to you this morning on Tuesday, the 25th of May. And the first item coming up is a reminder to you all out there about Canadian Clean Air Day, which is on June 6th. In case you weren't around for the last one, this is a chance for Canadians everywhere to focus on the problems of air pollution and to actually try to do something to help reduce the problem. How many Canadians do you think die annually because of air pollution? 2,000? 3,000? Well, the rate is a staggering 5,000, and it's likely to grow, unless we do something. And... It's this concern with your health that's the driving force behind the government campaign that is sponsoring Clean Air Day. So what causes air pollution in the first place? Well, the transportation sector accounts for 27% of all greenhouse gases produced in Canada. It's also the biggest source of that thick, polluted air from traffic fumes that we call smog. 
and it's the tiny particles in ground-level ozone in smog that are the main causes of health problems and even deaths across the country. Of course, it's worse in the big cities, but researchers have only recently realized that all you need are low levels of air pollution to seriously damage your health, so we're all at risk. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So, what can we do to fight air pollution? Well, it should be pretty obvious by now that the way we get to and from work every day can have a big impact on the air we breathe. So the easiest action you can take on Clean Air Day is to accept what we call the commuter challenge and get to work on foot or by cycling for a change. If you have to use your car, try carpooling and share the drive, or better still, use public transit. If everyone tries this for just one day, you'll be amazed by the difference it can make to the air in our towns and cities. But there's more you can do to improve air quality. For example, you can plant trees. And if you don't have a garden, then you can do your bit in other ways. For instance, did you know that modern, improved wood stoves can reduce wood smoke by as much as 80 to 90 percent? So you can make a big difference if you upgrade the appliances you use in your home. The government is also working hard on your behalf to clean up our air. Its priority is to reduce the emissions that cause smog, and they have clear plans to get there. Last year, Canada and the United States agreed to reduce emissions on both sides of the border between the two countries, and they plan to reach their targets in the next few years. The government's also taking action to get cleaner fuels. It's already reduced the sulfur contained in gasoline, and it hopes to reach the reduction target for sulfur and diesel by next year. But the measures don't just focus on the motorist. The federal government's also working to reduce emissions from power plants and factories right across the provinces. You can find out all about government action and all the plans for Clean Air Day events. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing the subject of rock art. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello, David. Oh, hi, Mia. Sorry I'm a bit late. Oh, no problem. Thanks for agreeing to help me with my assignment today. I really needed to go over it with someone. Sure. You were going to talk about European rock art, weren't you? Yes, the rock drawings in the caves of Lascaux in western France. Oh, fantastic. Over 13,000 years old, I believe. What sort of drawings are they? They're drawings of animals, on the whole, but you can also find some human representations, as well as some signs. There are roughly 600 drawings at Lascaux. Really? Were they mostly pictures of bulls? 
Well, no, actually. The animal most depicted was the horse. Mm. Have a look at this graph. Mm. It shows the distribution of the different animals. You see? First the horse, and then, after that, a sort of prehistoric bull. Oh, OK. That's interesting, isn't it? And the third most commonly drawn creature was the stag. There were some other animals, but these are the main ones. What are the drawings like? I mean, what sort of style? Well, the bulls are depicted very figuratively. They're not very realistic. They're very big by comparison to the other drawings of people and signs. They appear to be almost three-dimensional in some cases, following the contours of the cave walls, but of course they're not. Amazing. Perhaps they felt these animals were the most impressive and needed to be represented like that. Yeah, maybe. The drawings of humans, by contrast, consist of just simple lines, like the stick figures my little sister draws. Perhaps humans were seen as less important. Hmm, perhaps. What about the signs? How did they draw them? There doesn't appear to be much evidence of signs, and those that have been found are usually made up of little points. Rather like Aboriginal art from Australia? Yes, something like that, but not as complex, of course. So, apart from the bulls and horses and stags, were there any other creatures depicted? In one or two chambers you do find pictures of fish, oh. but they're quite rare. What sort of size is the cave? It must be quite large to have that many pictures. Well, it's actually a number of interlinking chambers, really. Here's a map showing where the different drawings can be found. Oh, good. Let's have a look at that. The first 20 metres inside the cave slope down very steeply to the first hall in the network. That's called the Great Hall of the Bulls. Here. OK. Then, off to the left, we have the Painted Gallery, which is about 30 metres long and is basically a continuation of this first hall. But further into the cave. Exactly. Oh. Then we find a second, lower gallery called the Lateral Passage. This opens off the aisle to the right of the Great Hall of the Bulls. It connects the next chamber with an area known as the Main Gallery. At the end of the Main Gallery is the Chamber of Felines. There are one or two other connecting chambers, but there's no evidence of man having been in these rooms. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Is the cave open to the public today? Well, no, because after the initial discovery in 1940, it was opened and literally millions of people came through to see the drawings. Uh. Then in the 50s, the experts started to worry about the damage being done to the drawings and the government finally closed the Lascaux cave in 1963. Is that so? It wasn't really the tourists that were doing the harm, but the fact that after thousands of years the cave was suddenly open to the atmosphere and so bacteria and fungi started to destroy the pictures. You need a special permit to enter the cave now and very few people can get that, unless they're scientists or have some official status. It's a shame, but I can see that they had to do something to protect the cave. So that means you can no longer see this rock art? Well, not exactly. What they've done is recreate the drawings in a man-made cave, which you can visit. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. The authorities decided to reproduce the two best sections of the site, so they've created a life-size copy of the Hall of the Bulls and of the Painted Gallery. It's just a cement shell, which corresponds in shape to the interior of the original. So now you can visit the caves without actually harming any of the 15,000-year-old paintings. Mm -hmm. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a presentation by a student about a website she has designed for a supermarket. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 113 and 114. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. For my website design project, I decided to approach SuperSave supermarkets because I have an evening job at the supermarket, so I already have a slight insight into their organisational goals and workings. The field research for my project was in two stages. First, I had an interview with Mr Dunn, who is in charge of SuperSave's customer care department. I discussed the project with him in order to identify the supermarket's requirements. Mr Dunn said customers are often unwilling to make a face-to-face -face complaint when they've experienced difficulties with a product or a member of staff or anything related to the supermarket. So he said a website which allowed members of the public to get in touch with the organisation and bring the problem to their attention in a private manner might be very useful. And we agreed that I'd work on this. For the second stage of my research, I devised a questionnaire to put to SuperSave customers. I needed to find out about the customers' experiences of problems together with their attitudes towards making complaints both directly and indirectly. I used a mixture of closed questions, such as, have you ever experienced a problem at any SuperSave store, and open questions, such as, what would you find helpful about a customer complaint website? I decided to do interviews, rather than rely on distribution of the questionnaire, as I felt this was likely to lead to a higher take-up rate. I visited four SuperSave stores, two in the city centre and two in the outskirts, and altogether I interviewed 101 respondents. Then finally, I analysed the results. I found the results of the questionnaires to be very informative. I found that out of the total number of customers investigated, 64% had at some stage encountered a problem in a super safe store. Out of these people, the vast majority said that they hadn't reported the problem to any member of staff. They just kept it to themselves. The next thing I tried to find out was why they hadn't complained. Well, about 25% of the people I interviewed said the reason was that they couldn't be bothered and a slightly smaller percentage said that they didn't have enough time but 55% said the reason was that they felt intimidated. I finally asked if they would be more likely to complain if they didn't have to do it face to face, and nearly everyone I asked said that they would, 95% to be exact. I then set about designing the website to meet these needs. Once I'd completed the website, I made another appointment with Mr Dunn to find out what he thought of it. Mr Dunn said he felt that the pages would benefit his organisation by giving customers a new way of expressing their complaints and by making it easier to collect complaints, identify specific places where service and customer care were not as good as they should be and act upon them accordingly. SuperSave is already a highly customer-orientated organisation and he thought our website would be an excellent addition to their customer care effort. This is all well and good, but there still remains the general problem with websites, that there's a lack of access to online computers. 
Surprisingly, in my survey, I found that 88% of those interviewed had access to the internet, which I felt was quite high. But this access wasn't always direct. For some people, it was through their children and grandchildren and neighbours and so on, rather than being readily available in their own homes. This could prove to be a major drawback to the site, but it is still better to have it now to get the edge over competitors, however slight, and in the very near future, it is expected that almost everyone will have direct access to the internet. Another thing to consider is that at the moment I can only base our conclusions on data gathered from a tiny fraction of the supermarket's customer base. In order to get a better idea of how the site is doing and to see how well I have met my objectives, the site will need to have been up and running for at least a few months. After this time, it'll be possible to see whether or not people are actually using the site and if it's helping to make improvements to their customer service. It would also be interesting to study the effect of the site on staff at the supermarket. Morale could be dented as more complaints come in. Staff may feel they are being unfairly criticised and that there is no need for another way for customers to complain. But also, the site could boost morale by making staff come together to overcome the constructive criticism and they may gain more job satisfaction by knowing that they are making a difference to the customer. So, overall, I feel my website has met my objectives, but there is scope for improvement and expansion. Are there any questions? That is the end of part four.